challenge and adversity can lead to greatness and help forge better people, but is the reverse also true? Could a better future make less of us and our descendants? To this day there's still a lot of mysteries about how evolution works, especially how it applies to intelligent life, which can be aware of the process and actively intervene in it. We know how adversity can foster strength, that often evolution is fueled by a competitive cycle between predator and prey, yet can we extrapolate from this to say that in a paradise we run the risk of becoming subhuman without as many of those tests and efforts? It is a tricky topic, not to mention a touchy one, and one popular in science fiction. Indeed the idea even predates literary classics like H.G. Wells' The Time Machine or even Darwin publishing his theory of evolution, a term he apparently disliked. We'll be looking at several hypothetical cases today, such as the Morlocks from The Time Machine and the Chuds from that film, and see if this might be something that could happen here on Earth or on one of our future space colonies. We'll ask how it could happen and what it might look like, whether it might be a natural occurrence or even something engineered, like some evil galactic empire needing whole planets to feed its capital world and populating its farming planets or agri worlds with those bred or engineered for servility or simple mindedness. Now to begin, the modern notion of evolution is not exactly compatible with the idea of devolution. Evolution isn't supposed to have goals, so there is no ladder or hill we are climbing, There's no up so there can't be a down, but the word itself is associated with progress and Darwin himself only used the word once in his book specifically because the term had come to imply biological progress and he objected to that, preferring the term descent with modification. Given that descent means to go lower, this would probably have been just as bad a term to use since it would imply the reverse of progress, but of course Darwin meant descent in the sense of descending down a family tree. Nonetheless, humanity has often viewed descent in this sense as also meaning growing weaker. The idea of humanity growing more corrupted and inferior over time is common not just in many religions but is a common attitude even among generations comparing themselves to their disappointing children or heroic forefathers, that they are softer or weaker or less ethical or hardworking, that civilizations have golden ages that inevitably rot and decay. This sort of degeneracy, in human perspective, usually comes under three general cases. The first is that we are inherently degenerating, such as implied in biblical lifespans decreasing from Adam in the Garden of Eden to Noah's era and beyond. Sometimes this is specific to humans, sometimes nature at large. That the whole universe is running down, perhaps cyclically, running down from a more metaphysical and spiritual decay of which entropy is but one manifestation. The second case is that something triggered that decay, an event or location, like with Chuds. This is definitely a case of triggered degeneracy, originating from the 1984 film of the same name, the Chud, or cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers, are once human monsters dwelling in the sewers under New York City that were mutated by exposure to radioactive and toxic waste. This may or may not be hereditary too, but can happen to a healthy individual, turning them into a freak and monster. The reason for this change is that the city had secretly been disposing of its toxic waste in abandoned subway tunnels under Manhattan, marked as Contamination Hazard Urban Disposal, or also CHUD CHUD. The mutants of those tunnels lurk under the streets and feed on homeless people. The CHUD film is forgettable enough, and its 1989 sequel, Bud the CHUD, more so. But the idea got some cult status and gets referenced in The Simpsons, where I first heard it, Rick and Morty, Archer, Futurama, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and many more. The concept is common in stories beyond this one too, those individually corrupted or polluted, and a fairly common origin of monsters in our stories, rather than slowly degenerating over a longer time period of many generations. It's a common theme in Lovecraft-inspired works of cosmic horror. The film also features an attempt to exterminate the mutants no matter the cost and erase any witnesses of them by opening up the gas lines and asphyxiating them, and that's a common thread in a lot of fiction too, someone so driven to wipe out the corrupted mistake that they themselves become a villain. 
The classic novel I Am Legend, which featured mutant vampires who replaced humanity but ironically spawned the zombie apocalypse genre, has been made into film several times now, and not one of those adaptations has the book's ending, where our protagonist has become the nightmare monster to this new emerging civilization of vampires he has hunted for years, who have now hunted him down, and closes the book by having him utter the titular line, I am legend, as he also realizes that these mutant descendants of humanity are no longer just degenerate crazed mutants, zombie-like, but now a civilization if a primitive and violent one, and in his zeal, he couldn't see the transition. The Inquisition of Warhammer 40,000 often takes this approach by burning out whole planets that have been infected with corruption, called Exterminatus though in that setting's case this is genuine crazy evil corruption. They are, and in many other tales, just engaging in activity like cannibalism is seen to devolve one, and tilt you toward other crazed or degenerate acts, from which there is no recovery once begun. Note that word, degenerate. We might see this with some crazed Cthulhu cult infecting an area, or some other local cause, though it could also be something non-obvious like a beautiful paradise or golden age of civilization being the actual cause of the degeneration. This case can also overlap with our first case, maybe you listened to that snake and ate that apple, you wrecked that ozone layer, you paved everything over and replaced every forest with landfills and toxic waste dumps. So case 1 is inherent degeneracy, of people or the universe in general, while Case 2 has corruption being caused by something more local or infectious. Our third case though is that intelligence itself is not lost to corruption or degeneracy, but rather is a negative trait in a technological society, or viewed as such and we breed it out, and that one usually points to ideas like ignorance being bliss, which data and science say is not true incidentally, or that intelligence of parents is inversely linked to how many kids they have which is more debatable. And while we are confident IQ is based on both nature and nurture at this point, how much of each and in what ways remains a big question, making any definitive answer impossible for now. All three of these options, inherent degeneracy, triggered or slowly bred for in certain conditions, tends to invite a lot of non-scientific discussion, and often fairly mean-spirited or openly bigoted commentary slides in, of one flavor or another, devolution as a term basically implies dehumanization too, so let's be careful in our contemplation of it. I should also note that while the mainstream view of biological evolution is that it has no goals and makes no progress, I think we can contemplate devolution anyway just so long as we keep that in mind, that something growing less intelligent or more impulsive is backwards in our eyes but not meaningful in Darwinian evolution specifically, same as being kind or just isn't, and yet both are desirable to us, and valuable to us. And to be fair, not every theory of evolution takes this perspective either, orthogenesis and some other models that permit evolution to have a directional flow can contemplate something going backwards, but in the modern scientific theory it should be a rare coincidence. Some trait evolves, it helps the species thrive and catches on, but many of the critter's descendants are born without it anyway, the occasional mutant, and when circumstances render that trait less useful, those mutants without it now thrive. Circumstances do change. As best we can tell, the whale evolved into the ocean, back onto land, and back into the ocean. That's not a step backwards any more than putting on a winter coat than taking it off for the summer is. It would seem strange then that intelligence, the one trait that seems most universally useful, could ever be on the chopping block. I don't think I need to elaborate much on how intelligence is useful, but as we discuss with things like AI, sometimes general intelligence can be a hindrance for survival, slowing reaction times, and is where subconscious reflexes are vital, even though they often make you pursue imperfect strategies. Too much curiosity can also potentially doom a species, The Pandora's box fear is one we in a technological era know all too well and know is a true danger, possibly an extinction level threat, though it is still hard to see how that would make less brains a better trait. Of course what we mean by brains is a little tricky to define and may not be the same as IQ. 
The idea is problematic for many reasons we'll discuss today, but let's consider the Idiocracy case next. This is from the 2006 sci-fi comedy film by Mike Judge, where our protagonist pulls a Buck Rogers or a Philip J. Fry and awakens from hibernation centuries later in a dystopian future populated by a satirically stupid humanity turned gluttonous and dumb. He is determined to have the highest IQ and is made the Secretary of the Interior and discovers that they have major agricultural and ecological issues because they've been watering their plants with a sports drink instead of water. The film ends by having him become President, marrying and having three small kids, and noting that his Vice President married eight women and fathered 32 stupid kids. It is a satire and we won't waste time overanalyzing it but the two key concepts in there are that a technological society can get away with a lot of dumb and wasteful people or activities because of its sheer technological might, they don't live on the margins of survival, and that smart people have less kids than dumb people. I've joked about the former in our post-scarcity episodes many times, that one neat thing about post-scarcity tech is that it lets you settle a vast galaxy of countless worlds while also allowing virtually any system of culture or government to successfully operate in relative isolation, simply because the reduced pressure of neighbors and vast resources gives you an environment in which you have a lot of room not to run your show optimally and make mistakes, and from which people or entire mobile space habitats can easily migrate if they dislike it, and probably more easily than rebelling. As a result, we might see some truly incompetent and crazy civilizations manage to endure for surprising periods out among the galaxy, though hopefully as a small minority of cases. As to smarter people having fewer kids, I hesitate to call that a myth, but it is certainly exaggerated. Currently humans have a relatively short fertile period during which they can have kids and the sooner you start, all things being equal, the more kids you have but it is often seen as beneficial to wait to start, and so as a statistical process we tend to see folks having kids earlier who weren't as good at controlling impulsive behavior. Unsurprisingly, there is a pretty decent correlation between delayed self-gratification and IQ, and both with overall life success as judged by most common metrics. I would imagine there are many other variables involved there, and some may be cultural rather than cross-cultural over space and time. For instance, in the past when folks worked their farms, and mostly with their descendants as labor, many of whom died before maturing, you could argue that starting families early, even though they initially drained your meager resources and energy, was more like compound interest in a savings account, best started early and aggressively. So too, a civilization that is post-scarcity may not have this delayed start advantage we currently have either, or may have technology that easily extends both lifespan and fertile period, which derails the issue too. For my part, I would guess that's most of the cause there though, that currently it is generally advantageous to wait on having kids to educate and establish oneself, so those statistically more likely to pull that off have fewer kids by starting later on average. There are tons of people who are very smart or self-controlled but started families young and vice versa, but it's a statistical effect. And a parent with an IQ of 145 who started having kids at age 20 while the twin had them at age 30 has probably matured to greater self-control and education by then, but both still have the same DNA to pass on. Beyond that, this tends to be a sensitive and contentious topic, and one where science still has a lot of work to do investigating the matter, so we'll leave it there with the assumption that nothing inherent about intelligence makes you have less kids. But that certain circumstances in your environment might make it intelligent to pursue that path, and also that the genetic aspect of intelligence is made of various discrete, heritable traits you either did or did not get. You don't get 99% of a trait and your kid 98%, so that cousins by parents who wore twins, one who was smarter than the other by nurture and education, probably had the same genetics for inheritance anyway. Which is probably important to establish since if it were true that IQ was a strong factor in how many kids we had, and that each generation had a slightly lower IQ than the one before it, when did it become so? and in what prior era of presumably stupider and simpler humanity did intelligent people have more kids than other people of lower IQ? 
And while science speaks very unclearly on how intelligence and fertility rate match up cross-culturally, it is very clear on how intelligence and happiness link. While everyone knows ignorance is bliss and intelligence doesn't lead to happiness, science firmly establishes that the opposite is true, that people self-reporting their happiness level ranked by intelligence are overwhelmingly happier when smarter and less happy when less intelligent. Many things can cause unhappiness of course, and a smart young person might be depressed about problems they see and others do not, or feel they have potential that is unrealized and respect not yet given to them that they believe they merit. This would tend to indicate that civilizations do not tend to avoid intelligence for the sake of happiness, though that merely implies people aren't voluntarily and actively trading intelligence for happiness, or at least are not succeeding with this exchange. In Dennessy Taylor's novel Heaven's River, which I had the pleasure of being an alpha reader on, we encounter an alien species living at Topopolis, a very long and skinny megastructural habitat, see the Megastructural Compendium or that book for details, and their technology has given them prosperity and their general attitude has encouraged them to relax and enjoy it, and the book explores this concept of intelligence not being of great benefit in a technological civilization that's very automated. It's a great novel and still fairly new so I won't further spoil it, especially as its sequel is coming out later this year. However, we could imagine this situation easily enough. We build a space habitat or terraform a planet and let automation or ritual or both handle maintenance of it. You don't really need to be too clever to fix something standardized with training, even ignoring options for AI or self-growing and repairing mechanisms. You do need to be rather inquisitive and curious to poke at such mechanisms as an adult and damage them. Brains are dangerous and I could see that being a strongly discouraged behavior, but we might be overgeneralizing to assume encouraging people not to poke at the fundamental architecture of their world is also discouraging any other curiosity or brains, or that they should throw out their technical manuals and not keep copies around. As we noted in our post-science civilizations episode, where we contemplated cultures who had either discovered all core science or hit a wall or abandon further research, that is hardly an indicator a civilization will fall into nihilistic decay. Until a few centuries ago, virtually no one did science and people tended to lead happy and often curious and educated lives without pursuing new universal principles in physics. Just because someone solved a puzzle before does not mean you can't enjoy solving it yourself. One of my favorite hobbies is doing crosswords and sudoku puzzles with my wife and neither of us thinks we're doing anything unique and helpful there. A high-tech civilization also may have the science to eliminate mutation of DNA, or be a post-human civilization on digital substrates, or have mastered psychology and boredom. They may be nigh-immortal and so those great exports of prior generations are still around and even wiser with the centuries, though they may be even worse about spoiling their grandkids. And there's little incentive to become an export when Albert Einstein is still around and famous and as sharp as in his youth so impossible to catch up on in your eyes, might as well enjoy post-scarcity utopia instead. Nor is it hard to imagine a space habitat parallel to the Amish, or even that groups of Amish might commission big space habitats, people often have rather murky and naive understandings of how Amish attitudes on technology are structured or how diverse those attitudes are, I expect we'll see new variations spring from that or others feeling they want to get off the technology train. Nonetheless, we can contemplate a group of settlers commissioning a space habitat for their personal vision of pastoral bliss, and they might have chosen folks who sacrificed some of that bliss to learn to maintain the habitat, or a subculture hired for that role, or what they do with their kids who are too inquisitive. Now if you're watching this show, odds are good you would qualify as the latter, and I'm guessing that you don't have a desire to abandon all your friends and family who are less technologically inquisitive and curious to found a new civilization without them. So we should not assume this is an unstable civilization prone to turning to some caste system and eventual subspecies, any more than we have castes of electricians and mechanics and chemists who feel a need to become a separate society rather than just having clubs or groups to hang out in for appreciating that topic. Also, I suspect near-instant communication and virtual communities won't be common as things civilizations give up when creating their ideal anachronistic version of techno-primitivism. 
They might look like they live in the 16th century but they still have limited internet and cell phones. Of course such a civilization might have that built in as some sort of technological telepathy, see that episode or hive minds for more discussion of such concepts, but maybe they just have a group mind akin to the Unimind from Marvel Comics Eternals that they can briefly form for the mental equivalent of Voltron and problems that require that. Alternatively, we can't rule out stratification genetically, two groups of humans with major diversification by mutation or genetic engineering, and still living near each other or interdependently. This can also result in speciation at this point, one group retains or claims a trait and the other doesn't. This relationship might be symbiotic, or it might be parasitic. The fictional Morlocks and Eloy from H.G. Wells' The Time Machine are both weaker and dumber versions of modern humanity set in the 800th millennium, the Morlocks being nasty underground dwellers who eat the cattle-like friendly Eloy. The Morlocks and Eloy were both human descendant subspecies and pretty stupid, and the Eloy were only likable because they were childlike, and in the positive and cute sense of childlike. They both fit into the more classic pre-Darwinian outlook that humans were greater in the past and have been degenerating since, and in our case one sense of inherent degeneracy of the species, and of the world more generally I'd say. In the novel we see our protagonist travel further ahead in time, 30 million years, and there he encounters a race of butterfly-like creatures preyed upon by a race of crab monsters and a world of simple lichen vegetation and further travel show a slowly dying Earth. In the authorized sequel to the novel by the great Stephen Baxter, our time traveler speculated about those crab and butterfly-like creatures being descendants of the Morlocks and Eloi. Here you might get back the brains that humanity lost to become the Eloi and Morlocks, or lost further to become the crab things and butterflies, because you've introduced a predator-prey cycle that can presumably weed out weaker specimens and in truth there's no obvious reason why they lost it, beyond that inherent degeneracy notion which seems at odds with our current scientific understanding. Of course brains are very expensive, we use a lot of our diet and effort supporting ours, and the idea goes that absent predators or dangerous environments that need goes away, but a predator-prey cycle could also lead to ultra-specialized low-intelligence adaptations too especially in a dying world with less overall energy and biomass density in its ecosystem. Moreover, you could have other scenarios where this was intentional, people made dumb, and we should note that intelligent life forms can override or interfere with evolution. In Brave New World, they determine intelligence for kids and from the perspective that they only need so many smart folks, they have alphas bred to lead, and also betas, gammas, deltas and finally Epsilons, bred for menial labor. Those lower three casts are for menial and low thought labor and are grown in tanks and intentionally subjected to oxygen deprivation to make them dull and obedient, especially the Epsilons. It wouldn't be very likely humanity would naturally evolve into a system like that, but the technology already exists to do that if we wanted, and I think a lot of people would cheerfully embrace that so long as they figured it left them on the top. We could imagine someone deliberately introducing some genes that controlled intelligence that each popped up with a certain statistical reliability and showed an external sign, maybe you're born with purple eyes or hair if you're a genius, blue if you're very smart, and down the line to orange and red for very dumb, or some other trait like social skills. We are not fond of caste societies nowadays, but they have been common enough in human history and often did result in stable societies which might be appealing to many. Brave New World is also the setting that gives us Soma, the super drug that keeps the masses happy, and we can definitely imagine civilizations running on that option. Let's imagine somebody genetically tailored a plant to produce that drug in its leaves and be hardy enough to survive in most environments. Now you no longer even need technology to produce your drug, and how resistant to addiction or to the negative effects you wore might be the control on who is running a society, or alternatively, the trait that gets you weeded out. Now option 2 is our case where something went wrong, and turned people into mutants, freaks, idiots, cannibals or what have you, and something like a retrovirus for extending lifespans, or some super drug being bred into a hardy plant could definitely qualify as that event but so could nuclear wars or a ton of other options that fiction has suggested over the years. 
Just as a general reminder though, as popular as it is in sci-fi for gaining superpowers, in reality radiation and toxic waste are not likely to help you unlock any new abilities besides rapid tumor growth. We also aren't necessarily talking about narcotics. The spice melange from Dune, which grants extended lifespans, better health and prescient foresight, is definitely treated as a society changing substance that gives with one hand and takes with the other, for all that it has only positive benefits. At least if we ignore its tendency to turn extremely heavy users into mutant starship navigators. A society that has access to a limited supply of some drug that makes its users healthier, sharper, and longer lived is one that is going to end up succeeding in a lot of colonization and expansion and having a population larger than that limited supply can support, thus haves and have-nots. The game is very different if you can expand that supply to everyone, but then you also have cultural shifts when the average person is living in great health to age 300 and your rulers can literally see the future. In Isaac Asimov's classic novel The End of Eternity, which would seem to draw a lot of inspiration from H.G. Wells' Time Machine, we have a group of people called the Eternals, with access to time travel to any point in time after they invented it, and they use it constantly to do little shifts and improvements in the timeline. In the end they observe they've unintentionally been breeding risk-taking and expansionist behavior out of humanity, who never risk colonizing other solar systems and are never having much real mutation either. It's a stagnant, disaster-free civilization that sprawls over 10 million years, then much like in Time Machine, we are shown an eventual dead and abandoned Earth absent of intelligent life, then absent of any life at all. And that's a good segue back to our third and final case, which is the idea that intelligence itself might be that negative trait we want to get rid of, particularly what we might call exceptional intelligence. Sharpen the curve around IQ 100 so you have fewer outliers, maybe there's more people at 110 or 120 but virtually no one over 130, or maybe the average goes down to what we would score as 90. Not because we let it happen by accident, but because we invent virtually every useful tech and we are noticing that each new one is bringing little real gain to humanity but a larger risk of physical or existential danger. Simple version, an AI is handy but one too small can kill us off, and we don't really need AI that will reduce our workload to nothing. Honestly, very few of us even think that is a desirable goal. You get a civilization with automation just a little better than we have now, with some interfaces a bit more socially graceful than ChatGPT and some sort of renewable power supply allowing equal or better energy prices than now and you are a post-scarcity civilization. As we discussed in our episodes on that, those come in varying levels and flavors, and are not necessarily permanent, you can exit out of one by overbreeding or blowing yourself to pieces. It is not hard to imagine a civilization in which most folks live for over a century and with good health, in something like a modern mansion and work some job they like for the equivalent of part time, saying no to a lot of additional life conveniences and the research funding them. Better technology definitely has a flavor of pirate victories when we think about societies that get too reliant or spoiled by it. Moreover, nobody is building a doomsday weapon if you don't have anyone smart enough to design or manufacture it. Truthfully, they're not likely to whip one up in a lab, even with an old design, without a lot of specialized and trackable equipment. But if your geniuses keep inventing ever better options like a Star Trek style replicator, weapons proliferation gets really tricky to limit. There are a lot of reasons a society might decide it doesn't need the risk of ultra-high intelligence around, especially when they already have huge archives of science, literature, and art beyond what any hundred people could absorb in a dozen lifetimes. After Isaac Asma passed on, a trio of some of my favorite sci-fi writers, Greg Benford, Greg Bayo, and David Brin wrote a commemorative Second Foundation trilogy exploring that universe more and one of the neato suggestions was that they made or adapted some disease like chickenpox that virtually everybody got as a child and that most barely noticed but that a lot of the cleverer kids had far worse. Essentially it was causing a little brain damage to the smartest, and this resulted in a stable empire that endured galaxy-wide for thousands of years but was also very rough on innovation. Of course, if life is already very nice, further innovation isn't necessarily a great thing. 
Again, it's not really saving many lives or improving them at a certain point, one might argue, just adding in more potential doomsday vectors. I will also note that Greg Bayer wrote the Forerunner Halo novels where we see ancient humans being devolved by the Forerunners after a war. And so this case strikes me as far more likely, a civilization that actively seeks to curb its outliers to minimize risks because they think those are now exceeding gains, emphasis on they think, they may be right too but what matters is what that society believes is true. And this is decently probable because one of the answers for the Fermi Paradox people most favor is that societies get too clever and blow themselves up, or replace themselves with AI. We usually say that isn't a good solution, but there's a tendency to assume AI just keeps getting smarter when it might as easily get dumber over future iterations, dumber is faster to act for instance, and again we have a bias to assume evolution has some end goal and that it is big brains. These days there's an increasing worry that it's not the smart AI we really have to worry about killing us off, not because they aren't a threat but rather because something dumber than humans might do the job and occur sooner. Peter Watt's novel Blindside works with this scenario, and without spoiling it too much, aliens around the galaxy tend to have very high speed brains but are sub-sapient and basically go wipe out people sending messages around the galaxy because they view it like a massive spam bot sending irrelevant and non-productive nonsense out as an attack like a virus. Watts is a marine biologist and he takes us on some interesting science on the topic of how brains aren't always that awesome. It's a great sci-fi book with a lot of good science in it too, which is rarer than I'd like. But to close out on, for one final point in favor of why intelligence might be lost intentionally, for those of us who like our sci-fi, there's a tendency to assume an onrushing acceleration of intelligence and technology, a technological singularity or an ascension to some higher existence that's almost like a car crash and happens almost instantly, over some centuries in comparison to galactic timelines of billions of years. There are no big sprawling mega civilizations because they all go to the singularity like a quick explosion going off once they learn to do science. We tend to almost take this future as a given in some form or another, but it doesn't seem like it's all that popular even among us techie and geeky types, but if it is such an obvious future path and so clearly disastrous, at least from a certain perspective, why wouldn't civilizations put a halt to it? We talk about the unstoppable forward progress of technology and civilization, but that's just rhetoric. We expend insane amounts of resources to keep that progress moving forward and it would grind to a halt pretty quickly if most folks decided they were done funding it and stopped encouraging their kids to go into it and stopped praising those who do. I'm not sure if devolution is particularly probable, let alone if it involves some pathway to primitive underground cannibals, but as to coming to a halt and putting brakes on ourselves to not progress further, that I think has a stronger case supporting it. For good or ill, our society has always been nervous about our excess curiosity and Pandora's box and knows we flirt with disaster every time we open it, so it is possible we might go ahead and slam it shut and break off the key in the lock. And it may turn out the galaxy is made up of isolated wars that abandoned that box, or the remnants of those who never learned to curb their curiosity before their cleverness opened the doors to their own inevitable destruction. Today's topic was definitely one that emphasized the importance of learning, and I would emphasize that I think we're also learning more about how learning happens. As channel regulars have often heard me say, the best kind of learning is interactive and focusing on engaging content and visuals, and our new partner, Imprint, focuses on animated visual explanations, and most of their lessons are bite-sized and take about two minutes to complete. They help you understand complex topics quickly with content designed to help you stay focused and engaged, so you can learn more about science, technology, history, psychology, philosophy, self-help, business, finance, wellness, and more. Join the millions of users loading on Imprint and their expansive library of top-notch material, interactive content from best-selling authors, Harvard professors, and many other experts. Instead of doom-scrolling through social media, enjoy your screen time loading something new. Try Imprint out and start loading today with their 7-day free trial by going to imprintapp.com slash Isaac Arthur and the first 200 subscribers will get 20% off an annual subscription. So that will wrap us up for today, but not for August. 
we'll close out the month with our live stream Q&A Sunday, August 27th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, and then Thursday, August 31st with a look at Neotorm space colonization. Then it's into September for Livian Space on September 7th. On the 14th, we're asked about the infrastructure we need to build in our solar system to colonize it, and then we'll jump into Sci-Fi Sunday on September 17th to celebrate SFIA's 9th birthday with The Fermi Paradox Fallen Empires. And if you missed this weekend's Sci-Fi Sunday, Cyborg Arby's, you can check it out now. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, along with hours of bonus content, at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week!